Uh, I've now been around in the political economy sphere for the last 25 years. I've never, I've never seen the gap, the mistrust, the lack of confidence between the private sector and the government sector, the public sector, the politicians, as bad as it is now. Never seen it as bad as this. And we've, we've come through some very, very tough uh, parts in our history. Uh, how, do we, how do we get out of it? <clears throat> He's put forward the point of leadership. Uh, you have put it forward, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and that certainly is part of it. <clears throat> but perhaps a, a slightly different point that I would like, like to introduce. Aubrey did say that uh, the corporates of South Africa are sitting with hundreds of millions of rands on their balance sheet or in their bank accounts, and they're not spending it, and he put that down to the crisis of confidence. And I will, I will certainly not disagree with that. But I think there's something else as well. There is simply a lack of demand in the South African economy. And in this sense, I think we are following several other economies in the world. Until recently, even the US, it looks as if that's now changed. Certainly Europe even the UK. There's no question that there's simply not enough demand in our economy. And so part of the work that we have to do is to say, what can we do? What can we do to lift demand, to stimulate demand, and get things going? I've seen this so often. <coughs> Business people are ready to commit suicide. Farmers want to burn their farms. Everybody else wants to, you know, just dump into the water, and then the economy turns. And within six months or a year after the economy turned, everybody has forgotten about how, thing, how bad things were only 50, only 50 weeks earlier. So if we can get the demand in the economy up, you turn the economic cycle, I think a lot of, of, of the confidence issues will not be resolved, but it will certainly help for a slightly better environment in which one uh, can tackle your problems uh, with more energy. So, uh, that, that would be my comment on, 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 what, on what Aubrey said, and I think he gave us a very, very good speech. As far as uh, what the NDP has to say about all this, in the diagnostic report of the NDP in 2012, you know, most people have not even read the NDP's uh, final report, never mind the diagnostic report. <laughs> but in the diagnostic report, there was a, a diagnosis uh, of South Africa's uh, economic position. And it came down to a very simple one. The Commission found, the National Planning Commission said that South Africa is in a middle income growth trap. Of all the things that I've read about the South African economy, I think that one is closest to the, uh, closer to the mark. What is a middle income, economy, uh, middle income growth trap? Well, it simply means that your incomes have risen high enough, and with that also your cost structure, that you can no longer compete on cost alone. And just think about that pragmatically. Will salaries of MDs and directors and financial managers and also salaries of workers, wages, is it ever again going to fall in South Africa? Is it ever going to get less? No, I don't think so. Is ESCOM ever going to lower the electricity tariffs? No, the cost is now with you. Are you ever again going to drive for free on the Gauteng highways? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, if, we move to, uh, if we move from e-tolls to a petrol levy, then of course everybody will pay, there will be no escape. You will never again drive on the Gauteng roads at a cheaper cost. You get, you get the point that your cost in your economy rises. And as the cost in your economy rises, it becomes impossible to compete with people on a lower cost basis. So you will never again compete with Lesotho on textile factories, just forget it. All right, so what, uh, I think that is where South Africa is. How do you get out of this? Well, the only way you can get out, and this is extremely important, is a higher level of innovation that gives you productivity increases that take you into the next level. Think Germany. Germany's not a cheap country. Think the US. It's not cheap. Washington. My favorite thing, a glass of wine. Nine dollars. I mean, who can drink with those kinds of prices? It's impossible. <laughs> So, but why is Washington a successful economic entity? Why is Germany a successful economic entity and so on? Because levels of innovation, in spite of rising costs, levels of innovation give them even higher productivity and that's the name of the game. So if we as South Africa want to move forward, we will have to, we'll have to up our game around the innovation uh, that gives you productivity improvements. And the technical term for that, and forgive me for using that, the technical term the economists like to talk about structural transformation. And I think that's precisely what we need. Now, how do you do structural transformation? Well, the one I've already given you, innovation, and the other one is, 
you've got to in spend a lot of money on infrastructure. You can get those two things right, then, then you will grow at a bigger pace. And I want to leave just one piece of history with you. In the 20 years before we became a democracy, our growth rate was 1.5% a year. In the 20 years after democracy, our growth rate more than doubled to 3%. Now, people tend to put this all down to our change in politics, sanctions that have been lifted, foreign investment, and so on. And those factors are important, no doubt about it. But there's something unglamorous that happened between 1989 and 1999, basically a 10-year period. We saw a fantastic amount of structural transformation in agriculture, in transport, in broadcasting, in television, in tourism. Basically, all the sectors of South Africa went through enormous structural transformation. And that helped us to take growth from 1.5% to 3%. Of all the sectors I've mentioned to you now, there's one which is not on the list that did not go through big structural transformation. And that one was mining. <laughs> and once you see that point, then I think the rest slots into place. Now, here is, the, here is what my Jewish friends call the chap. We've, I think we've come to the end of the phase of structural transformation in our economy. Banking, as Aubrey has said, financial services, highly competitive. We've seen fantastic change in agriculture, transport, and so on and so forth. But there's one part of our economy where we can see a lot more structural transformation which will lift growth. And this is the provocative point. Are you giving me protection at this point? <laughs> I need an amnesty now. I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ANC, Mr. Jeff Adebe, said that the ANC wants to uh, tackle monopoly capital. I fully endorse that. I belong to the AWB, but I'm fully behind him on this. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> the, who is the biggest monopolist? Who is the biggest, biggest capital monopolist in the country? Government. Government. Spot on. Uh, think, uh, think Transnet. Think SAA. By far the biggest broadcaster in the country, by far, by a mile, SABC. And so we can carry on. So the question is, how much structural transformation can be effected in South Africa if we tackle the really monopoly part of capital in our society? Will that give us more innovation? Will it give us more productivity? And from that, more growth and more employment. And that's the provocative point that I want to leave with you.